So today, I want to talk to you about hidden bias and its effect on the future of science. So as in high school, I, um, I, I played a prank on my, my chemistry teacher. I had uh, flunked a chemistry test because I was above memorization. Um, and instead of getting mad at my Self, I got mad at my teacher. If she was going to make me memorize stuff, well, then I was going to make her stand on a particular tile in the classroom. Um, so I got a couple of my, uh, my friends in on this prank, and this is how we did it. The closer to the tile she got, like the more lively and upbeat, the more notes we would take, and the further from the tile she got, the more like dejected and bored, and we'd sort of look around. Um, and we didn't know how it was going to turn out, but within the first day, she would sort of like hover near the tile. And by the third day, she did not leave her tile. We thought this was the best thing in the world. She'd like stand there, walk over to the board, write something, come back, go to the Bunsen burner, come back. Looking back, I feel a little bad. Actually, that's a lie. I feel not at all bad. Um, but the thing that really strikes me is here is an incredibly smart science teacher who is entirely unaware of a huge effect, of a bias. And so, for now, our story starts here, um, Poland, if you couldn't tell. And in Poland, there, at the end of high school, are two tests that you take in English, or take in, in language. You have the advanced test, and you have the basic test. The advanced test, you just get it for extra credit. The basic test, though, you have to get above a certain score in order, in order to go to college. And Poland puts a lot of time and effort into making sure that these tests are unbiased. They remove the students' names, they distribute the test all over the country to different teachers. So hopefully they remove the bias. Well, here's a graph of the test scores for the advanced test. And you can see that it looks exactly like, you know, standard bell curve, normal distribution. No bias here. Great. But then we take a look at the basic test, and this is what we see. Yeah, there is an incredible bunching, something really funky going on at around 21. What's 21? Turns out that's the exact score you need to pass. Now, what's going on here? This is probably just human nature. These are not systematic cheating. This is just a teacher when they're grading, it's a little subjective, and if the student's right near the finish line, they'll just give them one or two extra points, and boom. They pass, they get to go to college. How awesome is that? So this is an example of what's known as a bright line rule. A bright line rule is when there's sort of a finish line. And if you're on one end of the finish line, you pass. At the other side of it, you fail. And Stephen J. Levitt, who uh, is of the University of Chicago, sort of uh, free economics fame, says this. Incentive systems, especially those with bright line rules, often induce behavioral distortions such as cheating. So here's my question. If my science teacher could be so easily influenced, can science itself be under the thumb of hidden bias? Our intuition says that we should look for a bright line rule in science. And it turns out science has such a bright line rule, and it's called statistical significance. Generally speaking, if your paper is not statistically significant, you won't get published. If it is statistically significant, you can get published. And this is measured in something called a p-value. And that bright line is at p equals 0.5. That means you will get the results of your study by chance only 5% of the time. In other words, 95% confident. If you have a p-value less than 0.05, great, you can get published. Bigger than 0.05, you're not statistically significant, you won't get published. So, our institution says, this is where bias would be introduced. Well, is it there? This year, 2014, there was a paper that looked across a thousand randomly sampled studies in psychology. And they looked for this bias. So what did they find? They found this. This graph looks an awful lot like this graph. This line here, is that statistical significance. And you can see just on the far side of the finish line, there are three times more papers than there are on the non-statistical significance side. This graph should scare you. Because what it's saying is that we are measuring bias and not truth. What we think of 
as rock solid scientific evidence is just bias. Now, for bias to sneak in, often you have to be near a finish line. What is the finish line here? Well, if you have 10 teams, say, in a hot new field, and each does three experiments, and they're looking for an effect that does not exist, how often do you expect there to be a statistically significant finding? The answer is 78.5% of the time. How about two corroborating studies? That'll happen 44.5% of the time, even though there's no effect to be found. It's just how statistics work. So you take that plus human bias, you start getting into to unwieldy territory. So as the author of this paper says, a substantial part of what we think is secure knowledge might actually be statistical error. Yeah. So, but maybe this is just in psychology. It's, it can't possibly be true in the clinical world of, of medicine. Well, a guy named John Ioannidis studied this. He's an epidemiologist at Stanford. And he said, let's take a look at 45 of the top most cited studies, clinical studies. Each one of these has been cited more than a thousand times. And they're from cancer to sudden infant death syndrome. The way you're treated, the way your children are treated are based on probably some of these papers. Okay. He looked at them and he said, 20 of them have been replicated. Yay, science! Things are working good so far. But 11 of them were never verified. They were never replicated. On top of that, seven of them were discovered to be false. They're contradicted. And on top of that, another seven of them were found to have biased results. So when you stack this up, that means there are fewer true replicated studies than there are not replicated or false studies. And that leads to what I think is one of the most bold and striking statements of the last couple of decades in science, that it is more likely in clinical studies for a research claim to be false than it is true. But there's hope. How do we fix this? Just a little further in that same paper, John Ionita says, well, the smaller the study, the less likely the research findings are to be true. It doesn't sound all that amazing, but flip that around for a second. That means the bigger the study, the more likely the research findings are to be true. And in fact, to return to that paper on bias in psychology, here they've graphed sample size, that is, study size versus effect size. And as you can see, as your studies get bigger, the effect size drops. In other words, the bigger your study, the less bias. Notice here that this is a log scale on the bottom. That means to go one uh, sort of mark over, you have to increase your study size by size a factor of 10. So this, I think, effect, the more uh, people in your study, the smaller the effect size, is at the heart of a thing called the decline effect, which is this worrying trend where, especially in hot fields, a, an effect discovered vanishes over time. In fact, the scariest version of this to me comes from the study of antidepressants, where in the last couple of decades, the effectiveness of antidepressants, as measured by clinical studies, has not just halved, but has dropped by a factor of three. So I think if we go 100 years into the future and we look back at what we're doing today, we're changing people's brain chemistry on science which appears to be dwindling away. We will look at that as barbarically as we do now, when we look 100 years ago and we used to treat mental illness with things like frontal lobotomies. So how do we solve this problem? Well, I think the answer is data. We need bigger studies. And not just 10 times bigger studies, or even 100 times bigger studies. We need 1,000 or 10,000 times bigger studies. And where, are the, where is that data going to come from? Well, it's not going to come from academia. It's going to come from tech companies, from internet companies. I mean, it's just economics. Why? In academia, we have to pay people to come in to be studied. Tech companies, we get paid per user. So to give an example of how this works in practice, the median study size in that 1,000 uh, randomly studied 
or selected uh, studies it's in the psychology paper was 92. I just chose a research paper from, from Facebook, a recent one. You know how many people it had in that study? 689,000. I have that little asterisk up there to remind me to tell you not drawn to scale. We sit in a unique time in history. At least in the US, as of this year, there are as many internet-connected devices as there are people. And we spend more time with our phone than we do with our family members combined. And that lets us do incredibly powerful things from a data collection standpoint. So an example is a little company called Ginger.io that makes an app for Android. And they can detect when people relapse into depression faster than when that person's significant other can tell. We saw Linda Avey just a little bit ago from 23andMe does personal genomics. And they're leading the way in Parkinson's research. The average size of a study, a genetic study in Parkinson's, is 70 people. The last major study that, uh, that 23andMe did had 78,000 people. Jawbone, which is, which is where I work, is changing the way we think about doing science research. Instead of having studies involve 20, 30, 50 people, we get to use the millions of people worldwide. So we need a way of taking the data that consumer companies are generating and getting it into the hands of scientists. If we do, we can revolutionize things like social science and behavior change and psychology overnight. And we need to do it. Because right now, one out of three people in the US are obese. Three out of four are overweight. And the scariest to me of all is that in five years, says the CDC, by 2020, 52% of Americans will be diabetic or pre-diabetic. That means a kid born today, by the time she's five years old, one of her parents will have some form of diabetes. Well, how do you solve these things? The interventions are behavior change. Behavior change is applied psychology, but the effect sizes in psychology and behavior change are so small that we simply can't tackle them with the science as it currently stands. And that's why the problems are getting worse and worse and worse. But if you're a company, how do you get your data out? It's a hard problem. Right now, often, we just work with individual researchers. But that's time consuming. And we only have enough resources, generally, to work on the problems that we're interested in. Well, we could also open source our data. But this is deeply problematic. Even when you anonymize the data set, almost always they can be de-anonymized. So an example, really early on, AOL anonymized the data set around all of their search strings. So people searching for, for stuff. Great, said the uh, academic community. But aha uh -huh, said some of the hacker community. And they looked through the logs, and they were able to de-anonymize it. How? Well, how many times have you searched for your own address? In fact, AOL got sued because people were able to figure out not just people's names and addresses, but their sexual orientations and whether they had STDs. There was a study here in Belgium where they were able to show that using just four locations, geolocations, they can uniquely identify 95% of the Belgian population. That is, if they know just four random places that you've been in the last year, they know your name with 95% confidence. And if you go up to 11 points, they get 100% of Belgium. It's impossible at the scale we're talking about to anonymize data. So we can't just open it. We need some kind of new structure. So I have a proposal, but think of this really as the start of a conversation around structures that I think might help. And I call these things data banks. So imagine your company, you're trying to get your data out to solve these problems in science. Well, you want to get your data from you to the scientists. And so what you do is that you give it to a data bank. Now, a data bank would be a third party, independent, not-for-profit structure. They act as sort of an escrow. Now, if anyone here has worked as a data scientist, you know the data sets aren't just a snapshot. They're living, they're breathing, they change. And so the data bank would take part of that. And they would also take on the liability 
of working with the scientist, vetting the scientist and making sure it gets to the right one. And so now as a scientist, you no longer need to work one-off with each company. You just work with one of these escrows. I think because they're independent, we'd end up seeing a number of these things form as soon as we had one for the various different, different fields. And the flip side of what they would do is that they would act as certifiers. Just like we have organic for food, I think we need science corps for data. And so what these data banks would do is they would go to companies, they'd certify them. Are you collecting data responsibly? Are you following the best practices of science around statistical power and statistical significance? And if you get certified as a science corp, not only is that great because consumers can see this mark and say like, oh, yes, I trust this company. I want to support them because they're making science better. But also I think those companies should get tax benefits. Why? Because it's in government's interest to have science measuring truth and not bias. So we sit, I think, at a very interesting inflection point. Science is in a crisis. We are me measuring bias and not truth. The things that we thought were rock hard evidence seem to vanish. Everything from antidepressants to psychological studies. But if we can solve that by using the data already being generated by tech companies, by consumer companies, we can increase the rate of science discovery in the same way that at the Industrial Revolution or the advent of the internet, we hockey-sticked. And that, to me, is exciting. So thank you.